So noticing how it feels in the body to have shared a little happiness. To have received someone's happiness. You have felt like, I don't want to share happiness or I can't find happiness. Like whatever your experience may have been in these last few minutes. Appreciating this opportunity to tune into the body, to feel into the body, to recognize in the body how it feels. to be having or to have had this particular emotional experience. Whatever it might be, whatever it might have been, allowing ourselves, cultivating our ability to recognize it, to be with it, to tend to it. To recognize, be with, and tend to ourselves. Just as we are ever changing. Noticing the sensations in the body or the absence of sensation. Being aware of what you notice. And with whatever level of awareness has arisen for you, taking care of your posture. As we settle into a longer practice period. So maybe just as you are is good enough. Or maybe there's some small or large changes that you want to make. Maybe you want to stretch a little bit or have another sip of water or put on one more layer or take off a layer or lay down or totally change your posture in some way. Great. Listening into our own bodies, discerning our wisdom. creating the space so that we can shine through and we can recognize ourselves. Our needs, our aspirations, what makes us comfortable or uncomfortable. and discerning where we might want to make some change. Are there ways in which we can make some change to care for ourselves? And are those things that we might not 
love that we can't do anything about, that we practice to let go of. Recognizing that both experiences occur. And recognizing which is which. So that we don't get caught in trying to fix, improve, or change things over which we have no capacity to affect change. And we don't mistakenly allow ourselves to suffer when we don't have to. It's little adjustments can bring so much ease. How do we tell which it is? Discerning whether action or acceptance is the skillful means. It's a practice. And in the practice of tuning in to ourselves or listening in, to our guts, to our hearts, to our bodies. Can help us discern. And of course, as we tune into ourselves, all kinds of erroneous information will arise in the mind, come through one of the sense doors, no problem. This is the experience of being alive. As we practice, as we practice cultivating awareness, as we practice attuning to ourselves, we find that there's room for all of it. We don't have to push anything away. Instead, we can allow, allow our hearts to be as they are. Not talking about accepting unacceptable behavior. It's a different story. Greeting ourselves with love. Embracing this moment, embracing ourselves as we are, feeling into the heart and the guts. Allowing the body to rest.
Tuning in. Resting. Opening the heart. Welcoming yourself. And letting go of notions of how things should be. If simply resting and opening is available to you, please enjoy that. If a little more structure or support would be helpful. You might encourage yourself to open or welcome with each inhalation. I rest or let go with each exhalation. Or maybe you have another practice that supports you in resting in to the present moment. This is your path, your practice. Discerning what's supportive for you in this moment. What supports you to cultivate wakeful ease? In which you are both alert and relaxed. There's no right answer here.
Resting and opening. Tuning in to the heart and the gut. Befriending yourself. Just as you are. It's okay. Sad, mad, angry, frustrated, scared, confused. Sleepy, busy mind. Happy, elated, joyful, content. Satisfied, excited, whatever is going on is okay. Cultivating our ability to meet the moment, to meet ourselves as we are, as it is. It's like this. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. Learn to rest. Inviting, encouraging, awareness to rest into the body. Perhaps it would support you to rest in awareness of the sensations in the feet or the hands. Or maybe the body more broadly. The whole body resting here. Or the specific experience of hearing or seeing. Discerning for yourself for this practice period, what's most supportive and resting in to that.
tending to our internal experience. Recognizing and allowing Freedom from the fight. It's like this. Resting. Opening. Feeling. Being with. Noticing. Mm. 
What are you aware of? How does that feel in the body? Being with the body. Noticing, what are you aware of? Can you feel the body resting? Perhaps you feel the body bracing. How's that feel? What's your relationship to it? Pushing it away, chasing after it, kind of missing it, noticing. Opening, receiving, welcoming, and letting go, resting. Allowing. and tending to ourselves by greeting ourselves with kindness, with tenderness, with care. I got you. I love you. I'm here for you.
cultivating our ability to really be here for ourselves, with ourselves. Present to our pain and our joy, our ease, our agitation. Cultivating our ability to bear witness to it all. Resting down into ourselves. And opening to things as they are. Feeling this body resting here. Experiencing yourself opening to the moment. Oh, it's like this.
Resting. Opening. Allow yourself the gift of receiving the bell. And gradually Gradually bringing in movement and light, caring for yourself. Whatever form that takes in this moment in time. You know, this is your path. It's your practice. And as you continue in the exploration, you'll you'll discern, you'll come to recognize what supports you and what supports you will continue to change. It's it's not static, it's not a fixed thing. The thing that I want to talk about today, I want to talk today specifically about acceptance and the power of acceptance. Maybe some of the things that it's some of the things that it's not. We'll see. <laughs> but and with acceptance, that ability to discern when it's time to take action and what kind of action might be most helpful. I know that for me, I found that When I'm not happy about something, there can be a habit to jump into some kind of action. Like I'm going to fix this, or I'm going to fix you, or I'm going to fix me, or I'm going to fix that. And like this very out, 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 go, 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 do, do, do. In me, kind of an aggressive energy. And I don't find it's very helpful. It turns out it's not very effective. It doesn't feel very good. <laughs> And there's a lot of conditioning in that direction. Like, ah, I'm going to take care of it. And acceptance has allowed me to be able to discern when an action would be helpful and a more appropriate action, more skillful action. And not just out of like a, a gut reaction or habit or. You might think of it as the opposite of compulsive. Right. And we have these instinctive responses, right? If your hand touches something hot, if, if there is feeling in the fingers, the hand will just instinctively jump away from that hot thing. 
right? Like that's a, a, a response. It's a reaction and it's beneficial. And the heart of the gut might notice like mm, something isn't really feeling good here. I'm going to remove myself from the situation, right? So it's not that it's not always beneficial to be in reaction, right? There are times and places for most things. And in our day-to-day -day lives, when we are in safe enough environments, it can be much more helpful to cultivate our ability to respond rather than react. And for me, I found that this acceptance of like, oh, that's what's happening. And I'm feeling this and I can tend to this has allowed me and continues to allow me to be able to respond rather than react and not just be in this like compulsive kind of behavior. So I had the wonderful joy of being in Atlanta for many of the days since the last time I saw you. I went to visit a good friend of mine there. And when I checked in for my return flight, I saw that they had changed my seat. And I don't know how many of you are flying again, but I haven't been flying a lot in these last few years. But it turns out that now I'm kind of on the main airlines. There's this like bottom rung under economy <laughs> option, <laughs> which is a little bit more affordable, but you don't get a seat assignment. You just like get tossed wherever they feel like putting you when the time comes and you're probably not going to get your roller bag on or anything bigger than a little tiny backpack. So I was like, no, I want a window. I really enjoy flying across the country and looking out the window or wherever I have the opportunity to fly. I love looking out the window. It, it makes the flight really enjoyable for me. And I also like resting there and napping. I used to be able to nap on the plane and it's not so available these days, but still, I love the window seat. And I love seeing, seeing the land. So I paid a little bit more so that I could have a window seat. And I had a window seat on my way out. It was gorgeous. I loved it. The conditions were ideal. Got to see the city as we took off. And then all the snow. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like, we know there's a ton of snow. And I was up in Tower recently. And I know, and I know, and I know. But then, like, actually flying over the Sierras and seeing snow and snow and snow and snow and snow. And then a little bit of not snow and I don't know if it was Wyoming or Colorado with those beautiful red rocks and then more snow. And normally when I get to the Rockies, it's the first snow. And I'm like, oh, wow, the Rockies, snow. And this time I was like, yeah, maybe there's less snow in the Rockies than we have here. So very interesting and gorgeous. And I was able to just appreciate I didn't find my mind going into climate despair and disaster and all that. I was just like, oh, it's beautiful. How cool. And I landed really fresh because I had enjoyed my flight. And then so I go to check in on the way back and they moved me from a window seat into a, a middle seat. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and so I rested into my body. And I called the airline. And I said, hey. You know, and with a smile, like really with a voice somewhat like that, not like not not bitching, not moaning, not making anyone wrong, not complaining, but stating, hey, I booked this seat and I've gotten moved. I really was excited about my window seat and now I'm in a middle seat. Is it possible? Like more gentle language than is my custom. I mean, it's growing. You know, it's not totally foreign anymore, but it's not what I grew into grow up into is it possible is it possible it's like I, and you know the conversation continued for a while it's like i know it's not your fault like you didn't do it and like you know is it possible it's like well the flight's booked fully booked and there are no more seats and you know how the conversation goes and i and i just you know if it's possible it would be really it would be really great you know i paid extra so that i could have that window seat and if i'm not if I can't, then I'd like the, that money refunded. And she's like, well, there is one window seat, but it's like 140 bucks extra. I was like, well, you know, if you could do that and credit me that extra money, that'd be great. 
And I just rested. I was, I was at my friend's house and I had my own room. So I was just lying on the bed talking and relaxing, really practicing, relaxing my body, relaxing my body and being there with the conversation with her. Like, I totally know it's not her fault. She didn't choose this, right? She's on this all day long, navigating people who are pissed off. I don't need to bring her more pissed offness. And I wasn't pissed off, which is amazing. It wasn't what I wanted and I wasn't angry. And I didn't feel somehow um, attacked or hurt. I was freedom from really taking it personally, making it about me, right? It's like, I have a request, make the request without all the other shit that we layer on or that I layer on. And he was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. And I was like, wow, great. And then she tries to put it through and it doesn't go through. And she's like, oh, are you in the app? Maybe like you're in the thing. So like I kind of checked to make sure I'm not in there. And she's like, well, it's not going through. She's tried again. And she's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and she's like, oh, you know, my supervisor, blah, blah, blah. I didn't exactly understand what she said at that point. And then she tried a third time. She's like, yes, it worked. I'm like, great. Thank you so much. You're in seat 10A. I'm like, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And I felt really happy with myself for not going and fighting. But going in was like, I have this request. This is what happened. And I would prefer this if it's possible. Very, I don't usually use this word when I talk about myself, but very equanimous. Like, this is what I want. Is it possible? It's not attached. And then, so then I refresh the app or I open the app up again. And it hasn't, it's not any different. You know, as I saw the same boarding pass, I was like, well, I saw the same boarding pass, blah, blah, blah. But I could see my seat assignment has shifted if I go to a certain page on the thing. And she's like, yeah, they'll know at the gate. I was like, well, can you send me an email, you know, with the. So she sent me an email. There's nothing in the email documenting this seat change. But I was like, OK, great. It's just trusting. So then I get to the airport and I check in. And of course, there's no seat change. I mean, it is the original seat change. <laughs> And I was so angry. I was so upset. And even there sitting at the airport, I was able to just recognize, oh, well, you know, I let them know what had happened as best I could, that they were not interested in hearing it. And I was like, okay. Like I didn't have the compulsion to still try to like fight for what I thought was right. It wasn't worth it. It didn't matter. It wasn't that important. And so I had these two experiences of acceptance in really different ways that both brought, brought total freedom. And then I got on the plane and I knew that the seat assignment that they had shifted me to was a very low number seat, but I didn't think about it very much. It was like 7B or something. But I got in and then it's the seat with all this space. You know, there's like so much space. And there's something that's nice about all of that space. And certainly if you're going to be in the middle seat, having that space, it, it wasn't horrible. And again, it was, oh, right. What if I can just allow things to be a little bit, right? It's not about accepting the stuff that we don't want or like. It, it can be taking action, right? Like making the phone call, making a request, putting in the effort, stating my case at the gate. But they're not fighting. They're not being so attached and so caught and so trying to make something the way that I think it should be, the way that I want it to be. And yes, still, I went and I did check the clues in the seat that had originally been assigned to me. <laughs> yeah. But they're still crazy. You know, I'm not like free from crazy. <laughs> Uh, Did you glare at them? Not at all. I had no anger. It was pure curiosity. It was real interest. Did they seem deserving? Well, that's a great question because that's what's going on, right? Because she said to me, she said, she said, well, I don't know why they had to change it. You know, maybe, maybe it was a, a family traveling with a small child and they needed to be together or something. I was like, okay, fine. Really recognize, like, don't know mine. Like, I don't know. I actually have no idea. I know that I got booked through a certain seat and I'm not in that seat anymore. And they gave him some money so I could have that seat. Like, sure. But I don't have to be caught in the spinning story about it. It did seem to be a couple. So it's like, okay, you know, that's great that they get to sit together. And it was really how I felt about it. And it was wonderful to not be fighting. 
not be fighting the experience, to be accepting life as it is. Would you like to come in? Please. Yeah, I was talking about acceptance and flying and not getting the seat that had originally been assigned to me that I wanted. And having it be okay, not having to fight about it. It was really freeing. I just flew in from Atlanta yesterday. Really freeing. And so I thought it would be an interesting thing to talk about and a useful thing to talk about. And to remind us that it's not about just accepting things like the fact that we have to do all the time and become a doormat. Like that is not the goal. And so that we can discern when is wise action called for, right? Like I made the phone call, I did what I could do, and then I let go of the results, right? And it's so freeing. And yeah, I was not happy when I got there and it was clear that I wasn't, that wasn't what was going to happen. When I started to try to talk to the, the person at the thing where you go through, it's like not even a desk anymore, but you know, whatever, at the gate, started to talk to the flight person at the gate. I could, I knew like they weren't having it at all. I'm like, okay. And I just sat, went back, I just sat down. I had to find enough seat there to wait a little bit. And it was so clear there was no reason to push. I wasn't going to get anywhere. I was going to get riled up. I was going to get them riled up. I mean, we're going to have like some kind of thing. Like, who's that going to help? Who's that going to help? And that, you know, that's how I grew up. That's what you do in Philly. <laughs> Everyone, you know, you're fighting. That's how you survive. I don't have to fight all the time anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I might just stay with the flight for a minute before I'll go into stuff that's like maybe a little bit more dharma. But, you know, and then they have these waves of boarding. And so now I'm in the fourth wave of boarding because of my new seat assignment. And before I get close to the thing that you walk down. The overhead baggage is full. We're going to be checking all of your bags. I, was like, I knew that was what was going to happen next. And so when it happened, I was like, okay. I didn't have to be in the fight about it. Someone else was bitching about like, yeah, and then you get on their showroom. I'm like, yeah, I know the drill. And okay. And so my bag got checked and my shoulder's kind of bothering me. So I didn't have to put my bag up above and I didn't have to pick, take my bag down. And because I was at the front of the plane, I got off with ease. And so I kind of assumed I would have to wait forever for the baggage. I didn't have to wait very long. My bag was like the third bag off because of course it was the last bag on. It just was very easeful. And I could have been in there fighting the whole way, right? I could have fought so much that I was like steaming for the six hour flight. Ah. So I'd like to invite you, close your eyes if you want or not. I don't give, I don't care. I was gonna say, I don't give a shit, but I really don't care <laughs> what you do with your eyes. And if it supports you, you might close your eyes to notice any resonance in your system <laughs> with the habit of fighting or moments of letting go, moments of acceptance, moments of discerning wise action and taking wise action. And maybe you have some stories that arise in you of similar experience when you fought or when you didn't fight and when you felt the freedom of the freedom of speaking up for yourself the freedom of not fighting, a moment of discernment, action or acceptance. And can you feel the body, the feet, the seat, the back, the shoulders, the hands, the gut, the heart, feeling into your own body, 
resonance, dissonance? Is there an agitation in the body? Is there a settledness? I know for me right now, there's an agitation in the body. I'm noticing. And I don't have to judge it. Like that's freedom. It's like, yeah, there's a, there's a little agitation in the body. Okay. And continuing to do whatever supports you in the moment. One more little thing about the flight. We're about an hour out of San Francisco and the someone comes on the overhead, the, the pilot or the captain or whatever. Says we're about an hour outside of San Francisco. And if you're on the right-hand side of the plane with a window seat, <laughs> I would have been on the left. So that was a great moment. I was like, yeah, see, still, I still could have touched like, oh, I want, why, want, want. You can look out the window and see the Northern Lights. The whole plane got so excited. Everyone's in the aisles, going to different windows. People are sharing their windows, picking photographs. And it was interesting to feel the energy of the plane shift like a little bit more community as there was something fun that people could share and experience together. And people had photographs of like purple lights in the sky. But if you look through the window with your eye, I was able to see it's a dark sky. It was getting close to 10 o'clock in San Francisco. So whatever time it was in that space in that moment, dark sky could see like these shafts of a lighterness. <laughs> like not light, but lighter. Just these shafts and moving a little, changing. And I haven't seen the Northern Lights. So it was interesting even just to allow myself to appreciate what I could see, what I could experience and not that graspy, like it's not green or whatever. Like, <laughs> like, oh, that's so cool. Like we're right here it, in North America, like over Nevada or I don't know, Utah, California. And, and there we were seeing, seeing something in the sky that the captain pilot recognized and shared with us. And then the passengers shared with each other. It was pretty cool. And it seemed like it wasn't really fun for the flight attendants. They were kind of annoyed. <laughs> right. And that's a good reminder that nothing is all one thing. But there's a balance with everything. Mm. Yeah, so acceptance. Each moment arises as it is due to some causes and conditions that have precipitated that moment and have blossomed so that this thing arises. That's how it is, right? I've said that before. I'll probably say it a thousand more times. Like, that's how it goes. And we can sometimes take an action in the present moment to inform the next one. But this one that arose, that's just how it arose. Like. You can't change this moment and we can do something to inform the next, but the next comes really fast, right? So sometimes it feels like we're informing the present, but like, that's not how it goes, but the present informs the future. And Thich Nhat Hanh would say the best way to take care of the future is to take care of the present. The best way to take care of the past is to take care of the present. And the present is the place where we have this choice and we can discern acceptance or action. What's helpful in this moment? What does this moment call for? So on the airplane, I was reading a book by Larry Yang called Awakening Together. And I'd like to read you a piece of that. Larry wrote... There's a famous story about a meeting between a warlord general and a Buddhist monastic. The warlord was conquering the countryside 
and violently taking over the lives and property of all its inhabitants. When he came upon the temple of a renowned meditation practitioner, this monastic, he intended to ransack it and destroy all of its resident monastics. As the warlord entered the meditation hall, he beheld the temple's abbot sitting perfectly still in its center, calm, composed, and with complete poise, as if nothing was happening around them. Charging up to the sitting monastic, the warlord roared, do you realize that I am the kind of person who can run my sword through you without batting an eye? And without missing a beat or even the length of a breath, assuming this monastic was practicing Anapanasati, awareness of the breath coming and going. The practitioner replied, and do you realize that I am the kind of person who can sit here while you run your sword through me without batting an eye? The response stopped the general in his tracks. The meditation practitioner's nonviolent action was much more powerful than any force that the general could muster. The general not only stopped in his tracks, he stopped his rampage across the countryside. The warlord became a monk under the tutelage of this abbot and developed a life of peace. And of course, when the violence within the general was extinguished, the violence in the countryside also ceased and the people thrived in peace that resulted from his transformation. There is an intentional relationship between personal spiritual practice and how we live together in community in the world. What we do when we meditate and are mindful is directly connected to what we do in our lives when we are off the cushion. The peace and stillness that we are inclining toward, strengthening and cultivating in ourselves are no different than the peace and stillness we wish to see in the larger world. The shifting of our inner lives toward the clarity of discernment and wisdom and the gentleness of heart and spirit can be forces to transform the larger world around us. There are several things in there, but a piece of it the piece that I'll start with anyway is this crazy, magical, powerful acceptance that that monastic was exhibiting as as they sat there with the warlord coming in like that, like all that shit that was going on. And they're like, no, my practice is strong enough for this. Right, like they did not try to fight. They sat. They cared for, they tended to the moment, they tended to their breath, they tended to their experience. I don't, I don't think that my practice is, I'm not suggesting my practice is as developed as that practitioner and that that's how I would respond to that moment. I have no idea. <laughs> Don't expect to be in that moment. And I do know that, that, that this tumult that was there for me around the, my seat, that I, I didn't get up and fight. And that's freedom. And that freedom has come through time on the cushion, not fighting all the other shit that happens inside. Because right? there's stuff that's going on in here, less and less, thankfully. 
But that's because I've been able to sit with it and be with it. And I have less and less compulsion to try to fix it. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a time for an action, right? Yeah. And I have found that as I've practiced more and more acceptance, that I'm kinder and gentler. I'm kinder and gentler with myself. I'm kinder and gentler with others. But it's nice on the phone. I was nice. So amazing. I remember my growing up in Philadelphia, my father took me to the baseball game a lot. My, my parents divorced when I was four. And so in order to see my dad, I mean, I, I was with him every other weekend, but in order to be together, most we had to go and do some activity. We had to go do something. We weren't like, we didn't live together. And the baseball game was something that he could afford. And so we often went to the baseball game. Sat up in the nose, we drove behind home plates. And I don't know what was going on, but I was mad about something. And I, I guess I spoke partially or rudely to someone. I had no idea because I think that's how I spoke most of the time. And my dad said to me, you know, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. And I was like, I don't want any flies. <laughs> yeah. And today I can hold that in a different way. Like I, I understand that expression to actually be for a being who wants flies, who needs flies, who is nourished by flies mm -hmm. and how much more effective it is to be kind and gentle, maybe to be sweet, right? Not saccharine sweet, honey sweet. <laughs> to be sweet and gentle and not acidic, right? And so now today, sometimes when someone greets me with acid, I don't have to respond, but I can just kind of move out of the way. Like, okay, <laughs> you're like, that's yours. Oh, I, you know, I don't need, I don't need to take it on. And then there are times when I root down into my body, I feel my feet, I feel my seat and I speak up. I'm like, no, that's not okay. That thing you just said to me or that thing I just saw you do, uh-uh. And I do my best to use I statements and to speak from my experience and to say that how that makes me feel and why I would like you to do this other thing. That's something that I've, I really cultivated, particularly in training people who are becoming meditation teachers to help them find the language to say what the alternative behavior is that they would prefer rather than they didn't like this thing or don't do this thing, try this. This, I think this would support me more. And in that a practice, I've found myself doing that more with my partner. And I feel so much better. I know if he asks me to do something different in the future, rather than tell me how I did something he didn't like, I'm much more receptive. And when I notice that in myself, it encouraged me in that direction as well. So in this practice of acceptance, I found able to find my ground a little bit more. And then I can take a wise action to ask for what I, what I need or what I want or to make a request or to care for myself, right? So often historically, it was like, I need the outside to change like you or that or some cultural nonsense so that I can be okay, so that I can feel better. And that shit is a mess. And if I'm waiting for it all to get better out there in order for me to be okay, I might never feel okay. But when I recognize, oh, this thing has happened and I'm feeling this because of this and I tend to how I'm feeling, well, then I can take an action to maybe help that thing a little bit, to improve that thing a little bit, but not from a place of anger. Not from a place of anger. And then I'll close with something from Thich Nhat Hanh. He shared in watching videos where there was no sound of rallies and protests of people who were, I think what we might think of as progressive, maybe a rally in San Francisco. 
really against something that was happening, some atrocity in the world, standing up against it. And you watch the video of them and they look miserable, angry and miserable. And there's so much negative energy and really, really. Ugh. And then you watch a video of someone somewhere else, probably maybe here. Who is rallying for something that they really believe in and that they're really for that I know I myself might think is awful, but they're really into it. Like they're really supportive. They think it's the best thing ever. You see their energy. It's beautiful. And that, that story, and he names specific, more specifically what the two causes were. I don't, I'm not going to do that really helps to inspire me. Like, what am I for? I guess there's one more piece on that. What am I for? I went to Washington, D.C. when the former president was inaugurated. The most recent former president was inaugurated for the Women's March. And I, the night before, I guess, I was really miserable and I couldn't sleep and I was so angry. There was so much of that aversive energy. Like, this isn't okay. This has to be different. I don't like this. He's an asshole, blah, 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 blah. I was miserable. And I talked to my partner and he had gone to Sangha and he said someone at Sangha had offered this idea, like, well, what are you for? And I was able to, oh, what am I for? And like all the things that I'm for, which is why I was wanting to be present there and shifting my energy toward that and shifted everything. And so I invite you to continue to cultivate acceptance, acceptance of yourself as you are in response to the moment, right? Not acceptance of unacceptable behavior, but acceptance of this moment is like this. And what's the wise action that I can take in this one? Care for myself, some kind of self-soothing, make a phone call, right? And to a friend to get support or to try to change something, rally your friends to <laughs> have a march. Like, you know, what are you going to do? And from a place of aspiration and hope and love and joy, from a place of freedom, rather than from a place of anger and frustration. Mm. And cultivating acceptance as a platform for that, as the foundation to awareness and wise action. It's like this. How can I be with myself amid this, amidst this? And tuning into your body. However supportive for you to do that, nothing need change on the outside. Feeling your body. Recognizing, allowing, embracing, accepting what's here. And knowing that by coming together and practicing, things are shifting inside of you. And they're shifting, sometimes at a glacial pace, but shifting in how we interact with others. And through that, our practice is of benefit to ourselves and the world. And checking in, is there some discernment or some wise action that's arising in you you might engage in to care for yourself or to care for something or someone you care about from a place of love <laughs> acceptance and action
Thank you for your practice. It's a journey, right? It doesn't happen like this. You know, for years I was practicing cultivating mindfulness and awareness and then still totally losing my shit at my partner. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, I'm so committed to this practice. I'm so engaged. And then I lose it. And I'm here to say that I don't lose it so much anymore. And you know, it, it took, it's taken me a long while. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting close to 20 years of dedicated practice. <laughs> so I hope you have a, a faster path. <laughs> And but sometimes we need other supports, you know, not just meditation, but we need other supports. I know I did. And the freedom is possible. And that freedom shows up in all kinds of unlikely ways. And that it's totally possible in the here and now. Yeah. Ah, so some announcements. The the collective, the San Francisco Dharma Collective is a completely Dana-based, generosity-based entity. So as your pocketbooks allow, any contributions that you can make are very welcomed and much appreciated. And your contributions of time are also really appreciated. Julie is contributing her time so that we have a Zoom host so that we can make this hybrid hybrid model work. Walt often, often contributes his time as the Zoom host. Tom is contributing his time so that the door is open, the space is available. He arranged all of the furniture so that we could sit here together this evening with the candles, put the cushions out. We all come together to allow the collective to exist, allow it to exist. And then I have the, the great opportunity to be able to sit in the seat and share my experience of the Dharma. It's gonna be totally messy and completely imperfect. So take what you like and leave the rest for sure. Keep coming back, there's lots of other teachers. And I don't show up exactly the same way each time either. And your financial contributions support me. This is my livelihood. This is what I do. So they're really appreciated. And the practice of generosity is a profound practice. It brings us freedom, actually, because I don't know, maybe you're not all greed types, but I'm a greed type. And the practice of generosity helps to care for that. Helps to care for that. You can grease one of the poisons. <laughs> so you can play with that as supports you. And please check out the website and the newsletter to find out about all the other great offerings that are happening here. And next week we will enjoy exploring the five mindfulness trainings as offered by the Arise Sangha in the Plum Village tradition, which is awakening through race, intersectionality, and equity and they've offered some beautiful training so I'll, I'll bring them my intention is to bring them printed out and disperse them so that five people can read see how that goes and i've been sharing that there's a retreat coming up soon that i in the plum village tradition i think will be really wonderful I'm definitely going to be there. There are a few other people in the room that have already registered. So check it out if you're interested. It's Memorial Day weekend and it's in Ukiah. And it's basically a camping retreat.
focused on transformation and healing specifically through the doorway of play. So I plan to send it out to the people who have registered RCP for this. So you'll get it electronically, but if you have it and you'd like the information, let me know. Take good care of yourselves. See you next week.